You do not know me, but be forewarned, dear reader, I certainly know you. Bridgerton may abound with corsets, titles, and marriage plots, but make no mistake, this is a show about today. In many ways, Bridgerton feels like modern, big-budget fan fiction. For a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. The Duke has been overheard announcing to mamas everywhere that he has no plans of ever marrying. This author wonders which brazen matchmaker shall rise to such a challenge. It has a lot of fun with the pomp, ceremony, and matchmaking we all love in Jane Austen novels, but it remixes the genre to add some elements we might wish were part of Pride and Prejudice, like today's pop music. <laughs> actors of color playing dukes and ladies, and a lot more bedroom scenes. Are you yet with child? We have certainly been devoting our energies to the endeavor, Your Majesty. This Regency-era period drama presents a society that feels oddly familiar, one obsessed with publicly sharing private details and harshly unforgiving of incorrect behavior. I've not had a caller in three days. My mother swears we are ruined where old-fashioned masculinity is ailing and women are on the rise. You like to speak of responsibility. My dear son, of duty? Pray tell, what should you know of it? And where it remains a rarity for people to make decisions guided by love. Or will one's future see the rarest accomplishment of all? A true love match. Here's our take on what Bridgerton's sexed-up, scandalous Regency England has got to say about our 21st century society. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions of people come together to take classes that fuel their creative journey. The first 1,000 people to use the link in our description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So become a member today and start exploring your creativity for less than $10 a month. Bridgerton's strangely modern-feeling alternate history version of 1813, the year Pride and Prejudice was published, suggests that our culture has become so fixated on image that we allow the fickle whims of public opinion to determine our private fates. There is but one thing that humbles even the most highly regarded members of our dear Ton. A scandal. Like an old-school gossip girl, Bridgerton presents a world whose primary currency is reputation and whose shared fixation is scandal. Everyone enjoys secrets. Otherwise, why would Lady Whistledown's paper be so successful? According to historian Catherine Curzon, gossip columns did explode in the Georgian era, roughly defined as from 1714 to 1830, and Lady Whistledown herself bears a resemblance to a real-life 18th-century gossip writer called Mrs. Crackenthorpe, otherwise known as a lady that knows everything. If anyone shall reveal the circumstances of this match, it is I, Lady Whistledown. But this premise also feels tailor-made to mirror our social media-obsessed present. In Bridgerton, gossip has concrete value. The characters' fortunes rise and fall with what Lady Whistledown says about them. Though perhaps if she can destroy a reputation, she can restore one too. Likewise, in the monetized world of social media today, creators and influencers' livelihoods depend on the number of views they get, and celebrities' careers are tied to their ability to generate positive buzz and avoid negative takes online. It's this whistle down. I certainly never want to cross the woman. A word as good as gospel. Just like in Bridgerton, reputation in our world is not just important, but also very unstable. The unearthing of a past scandal on Twitter can suddenly tarnish a figure who seconds earlier enjoyed the height of popularity. But as we know, the brighter a lady shines, the faster she may burn. This is mirrored in how Daphne begins the season earning the seal of approval from the queen herself, but after a few bad decisions by her brother, her social currency rapidly dwindles to the point where she fears she'll be forced to marry Lord Burbrook. You cannot possibly be thinking of marrying him. If I'm unable to secure another offer, there may be no alternative. Strikingly, the solution to this personal problem and the string of others that follow it comes not through any private fix, but through manipulating her public persona. We could pretend to form an attachment. You must know men are always interested in a woman when they believe another, particularly a duke. 
could be interested as well. The show also illustrates how, when reputation is both so fickle and so valuable, this leads directly to cancel culture. Cancel culture, um, I would define as um, an act of public shaming. When Whistledown reveals that Marina has been hiding her pregnancy, the girl and the Featheringtons are effectively canceled by the Tawn. I must ask you to leave. But I have an invitation. Not anymore. Most viewers today could hardly relate to the reason for Marina's being shunned, getting pregnant out of wedlock, but they can recognize the result she suffers for breaking her society's conventions. I think there's always been a, a form of um, social censure. It just happens now to be online. Just as a debutante's whole future can be made or broken in one edition of Lady Whistledown's Society Papers, one viral post on the internet today can establish a public figure as trending or over. Bridgerton also reflects the way that subsections of society can develop into echo chambers, like the ones created and reinforced by social media today. In Bridgerton, the elites are shown to be wildly out of touch with everyone outside the small bubble of their social class. Are you not meant to be the smart one? You believe a servant would ever have the time to be Lady Whistledown with all the work we must do? Daphne doesn't get that the people in Cliveden need more than superficial niceness from their duchess. It is after careful consideration that I have decided that all three pigs have tied. When you could not choose a winner, no farmer won the contract. And Lady Featherington takes Marina to visit the slums only as a kind of warning that people who fall from her circle are utterly lost. I wanted you to see your future firsthand. Should you refuse to follow my instructions? Neuroscientist Don Vaughn claims that echo chambers actually inhibit empathy. Moreover, within a highly conformist echo chamber, it can feel unthinkable to break with the shared expectations of one's peers. I cannot see you anymore. Maybe the most striking point Bridgerton makes about our current relationship with social media is in the character of Whistledown herself. Throughout the season, we are invited to believe Whistledown could be any number of people, until the eventual reveal that she is, spoiler alert, Penelope Featherington herself. Yours truly, Lady Whistledown. Part of the surprise of that reveal is that Penelope and Whistledown couldn't be any more different. Penelope is kind and shy and seems too deep to care about the gossip-worthy goings-on of the taunt. Should you allow me to delay only a year, just as Lady Bridgerton has done for Eloise, I may remain dedicated to my studies, perhaps. But Whistledown is cutting, manipulative, and even cruel. Lady Whistledown has gone too far this time. In this choice, the show is illustrating a version of what's known as the online disinhibition effect, where the anonymity offered by social media can allow people to lower their inhibitions and, in some cases, become meaner. Because Penelope is writing under a pseudonym, she is able to avoid accountability for her words. Just as we see with many people's online activity, there can also be a rash impulsiveness to Penelope's writings. Looking back at her behavior, we can observe her personal resentments festering. I must make these difficult choices for myself and for my child, even if they hurt your feelings. Leading her to lash out with her pen. Miss Marina Thompson is with child, and she has been from the very first day she arrived in our fair city. The main way that Bridgerton preserves its time period is in its gender roles, while the writing expresses a modern outlook by spotlighting the hypocrisy of its society's double standards. I'm older than Daphne and you were happy to marry her. It is not the same. And the absurdity of how sheltered these young women are raised to be. How does a woman come to be with child? You, you, your mother... Yeah, my mother told me nothing. The long-standing Madonna and whore dichotomy is expressed as an artifice to reinforce class hierarchies. Someone must guard my poor sister from the box and pinks. Ensure her virtue remains free of any kind of defilement. Every woman is not afforded such gallant protection. Well, every woman is not a lady. Of course not, my lord. And the show highlights how women's collective obsession with marriage is not romantic feminine silliness, but cunning ambition. Marrying above one station is an art form indeed. And a savvy understanding of their one means of achieving worldly success. You have no idea what it is to be a woman. This is all I have been raised for. This is all I am. I have no other value. 
Again, the fan fiction feel of Bridgerton subtly updates familiar scenarios or character types to reflect today's perspective. Why should he be the one to choose your future when he clearly cares not for the outcome? As the younger sister of a more traditional beauty, clever, well-read Eloise Bridgerton feels like a modern twist on Pride and Prejudice's Elizabeth Bennet. Yet while Lizzie is radical in her time simply for wanting to marry for love, I am determined that nothing but the very deepest love will induce me into matrimony. Eloise, more true to our time, longs for a society where she wouldn't have to marry at all. Why must our only options be to squawk and settle or to never leave the nest? What if I want to fly? Penelope Featherington is also a Lizzie Bennet type. She does want to marry for love, has a wit that keeps all of the tawn enthralled, and isn't her society's definition of a great beauty. What she is is two stone heavier than she ought to be. Mm, those blemishes on her face are quite difficult to conceal. But rather than turning her into some perfect role model, the story complicates Penelope with anti-heroic tendencies, like her secret cruelty and conventionality. You should not care about marriage. Well, what do I do? Pretty, dutiful Daphne feels like what it would be like if you made Lizzie's sister, Jane Bennett, the protagonist and examined how she deals with her family expecting her to make a good match. One of us at least will have to marry very well. And since you were quite five times as pretty as the rest of us and have the sweetest disposition, I fear the task will fall on you to raise our fortunes. And her love, Simon, the Duke of Hastings, is an update to proud and aloof Mr. Darcy, who's here challenged to confront his bad emotional habits. Pride. Your grace, it will cost you everything and leave you with nothing. Meanwhile, the Featherington parents, with their financial troubles, lack of sons to inherit their estate, and position at the lower end of high society, feel like nods to silly, desperate Mrs. Bennet and judgmental above-it-all Mr. Bennet. But this dynamic is also remixed to allow more sympathy for Lady Featherington's hustle to provide for her daughters while her husband has selfishly gambled away their dowries. We were ridiculed by all today, treated as though we were worthless, and it's all your fault. How could I have been at fault? I was not even there. Well, if it were not for your habit. In the world of Bridgerton, masculinity is sick. I failed our daughters. I do not know what to do as symbolized by the king, who is largely absent from this story due to his mental illness. And just like this ailing patriarchal figure, the rest of the men in the town are portraits of broken or fragile masculinity, who fail to adequately deal with the weight of responsibility thrust upon them. You cannot manage it, can you? Hey, your responsibility. The Duke's father is a tyrant, so obsessed with his status and legacy that he has no emotional empathy for his wife or son. He's an imbecile. Your Grace. He is an idiot! Younger men in the show are pointedly taught lessons to embody more enlightened versions of masculinity. Prince Friedrich has asked for my permission to propose. What did you tell him? That I know better than to answer for my sister. Whatever you decide, Daff, you shall have my support. Anthony Bridgerton finally learns to respect his mother's and sister's judgment and desires after he messes everything up by bulldozing over both. A young woman who is terrified because she knows what kind of life, what, what kind of future awaits her should you continue to get in her way. Failing to listen to anything unless it's from the mouth of a man. Did you only change your mind about Lord Bearbrook because another man told you the truth? You truly esteem me so little. After I apprised you of my wishes and you proceeded to ignore them and rushing to ill-considered, hot-headed solutions instead of thinking rationally or strategically as the women around him do. Is it your own male pride that you seek to satisfy? As for the Duke, he stubbornly allows a grudge against his late, abusive father to govern every aspect of his life. I will never marry. I will never sire an heir. Which Daphne quite rightly calls out as ridiculously emotionally immature. You will neither have children nor the happiness we could have together because you promised your father you would not. Instead of talking to Daphne about why he doesn't want children, he bottles his feelings up. Why will you not unfold yourself to me? This typifies something known as normative male alexithymia, the inability many men feel to show their true emotions. Dr. Greg Enriquez explains, their masculine identity conflicts with many emotions they feel and what they feel they are allowed to express. You 
What's it all but a few words to me? In order to keep myself from saying the wrong things. Much of the conversation around men's mental health in the 21st century is around breaking this cycle and allowing men to open up about their worries. Overall, in Bridgerton, men still hold the top positions of formal power. But it's the women who are secretly in charge, flexing their independence. It is quite the ideal situation to live a separate life to one's husband. Having their own fun. Welcome to my den of iniquity. Taking control of situations. Lady Whistledown really writes what she sees. Perhaps we need to help her to see things a bit more clearly. And finding ways to impose their wills within a patriarchal society. Why should you be left all alone to bear the punishment for his crime? You truly think you can do this? I'm quite capable of doing more than you think. Perhaps this is what the show, from executive producer Shonda Rhimes, one of the most powerful women in entertainment, means to reflect about our times. That men are struggling with their power, while women are claiming theirs. Even if they're still more constrained by gender norms than we like to admit. And who will believe a group of women over a man's word? Perhaps no one. But they will if Lady Whistledown does. So we shall do what women do. We shall talk. It's through Bridgerton's diversity that this fan fiction most explicitly chooses to reflect our contemporary society over historical accuracy. Bridgerton isn't the first to cast people of color in roles previously reserved for white actors. You ready to ascend the Darcy throne? Steer clear of that Benny girl. Lizzie. But where Bridgerton is different is that it's not actually a colorblind show. It's using its black characters' stories to explore aspects of race in our modern society. It presents a world where some people of color have achieved highly visible positions of power, whether we're talking about a Duke of Hastings and a Queen of England, or a President of the USA and a Queen of Hollywood. Yet the show also explores how these characters can be made to feel like outsiders and to fear that their recently won position in society are precarious. You may have elevated us from novelties in their eyes to now dukes and royalty, and at that same whim, he may just as easily change his mind. Simon's father's cruelty in his pursuit of the perfect heir seems to stem from knowing that his status in society is insecure. We have been granted this line. The monarchy itself has declared it, but it will only remain ours so long as we remain extraordinary. His fear echoes how contemporary people of color might likewise feel that their success depends on them being exceptional and avoiding mistakes white people can afford to make. You have to be twice as good. Twice as good as them to get half of what they have. Just as in our world, the majority of high society in Bridgerton is still overwhelmingly white and there is racism at play in myriad situations. You're a performer. A mere entertainment. We are happy to trade wages on the outcome of your fists, but no gentleman will ever see you as a respectable man of business. Meanwhile, it's striking that characters like Marina, Simon, and Lady Danbury tend to show more considered empathy for others who are lower on the social ladder. The farmer in the village is right. The estates have been neglected far too long. Well, is that not the steward's job? They are my tenants, my people. The responsibility is mine. In part due to their sense of themselves as outsiders, who must base their self-respect not solely on what everyone else thinks. It's terribly presumptuous of you to think that a visit to this neighborhood full of good, hard-working people who happen to be less fortunate than yourself would ever sway me to change my mind. Bridgerton's alternative history is explained by the backstory that everything changed when the king fell in love with a black queen. We were two separate societies, divided by color, until a king fell in love with one of us. Several historians do argue that Queen Charlotte, the wife of King George III, was a descendant of the black branch of the Portuguese royal family. And Bridgerton runs with this idea as its overall thesis, that love can overcome division. Those very things are precisely what have allowed a new day to begin to dawn in this society. Love, your grace, conquers all. We're reminded that Daphne and Simon are unusual for being a true love match. The famous love match. And that this is what can carry them through when it seems all hope is lost. I love all of you. Even the, the parts that you believe are, are too dark and too shameful. Every scar. 
While the classic marriage plot ends with the wedding day, Bridgerton looks more honestly at how love is not always pretty, how it's intertwined with sometimes problematic sexual dynamics. Can the ends ever justify such wretched means? And how much work it requires after the honeymoon is over. It is customary for a wife to reside in her own bedchamber once the honeymoon is over. A time that is well and truly passed, would you not agree? Ultimately, the way that Daphne and Simon come back together is, like any modern couple, through honest communication. You stay, and we get through this together. Lady Danbury and Lady Bridgerton try to encourage the young lovers to follow their hearts, as their experience has taught them that it's what truly matters most in life. What I wanted, dearest, was for you to have the best, not, not in terms of rank, but love. But at first, it's the young people who feel like they can't do this, trapped as they are by society's expectations. Love changes nothing. And while it may seem a lot easier to put love first in today's freer world, we still suffer from many of the constraints that these characters feel, if mostly in our minds. After all, how many of us would have the courage to turn down the most wealthy and famous potential husband on the planet for something as iffy as a feeling that you can't know for sure will be reciprocated or will even last? Fan fiction is an exercise in wish fulfillment. From the mornings you ease the evenings you quiet, to the dreams you inhabit. My thoughts of you never end. It allows us to look at worlds we love and imagine them as wider and deeper through expansive cinematic universes, origin stories, and fresh takes on existing narratives. Fan fiction invites us to suspend our disbelief, and in that act, we get to imagine how possible it is to leave behind norms that we might assume are set in stone. You watch Game of Thrones and you can suspend your disbelief that there are dragons in this world. For Bridgerton, you can suspend your disbelief that we have a black queen and a black duke, and I hope that it will, you know, be a benchmark for what period dramas can be without, in terms of without diversity. Question, yeah. Without question. By expanding the story universes of the past, Bridgerton shows that the potential for our future stories is limitless. I know that this is not what you had envisioned for the evening. Certainly not. And for that, I... It is better. This is the take. What do you want our take on next? This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community that offers affordable classes designed to fit your schedule and skill level. With Skillshare, you have access to live classes so you can connect with popular teachers and work virtually alongside other members. One Skillshare original you can check out right now is Holly M. Coley Murchison's class on creating your dream career. By the end of this course, you will have identified your core skills and creative strengths and designed an action plan to achieve your goals. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey.